Amen, if you will. Open your Bibles uh, once again, and, and really for the final time in this uh, inaugural series for 2022, uh, open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 15. We want to once again uh, look at these 11 verses. We have been thinking about what I call the, the gospel prophet, the, the accomplishment of Christ upon the cross for us. In other words, the, uh, the person and the work of Christ uh, for us, uh, for the sake of our salvation. And as we have thought about these realities, we've begun to uh, expand and extend a bit and to begin to, uh, to think about both the applications and the implications of that work of Christ on the cross for us, for our salvation. And it seems to me that we must insist that for uh, the gospel to be complete, for it to be holistic, that we must understand that the application and the implications are essential and intrinsic to the gospel message. That is, a powerless, impotent gospel is not the gospel. It must work its way into and out of your life. It must permeate. It must define who you are and how you live. And so I would want you to, to think about and ask and answer the question, does the gospel make any difference in the way that you think or the way that you live. Many years ago, I quite frequently would hear a, a bit of a cliche, a bit of a, a slogan. Oh, we're just like you. In other words, believers would say to their unbelieving friends, Oh, we're just like you. We're just going to heaven. Or, we are just forgiven. It was, it was a type of stubborn pride that we live and act exactly like the unbelieving world, but unfortunately for you, but fortunately for us, we're going to heaven. That did not stand then, and it will not stand now. That is, that the, the gospel must inform and it must define us, the people of God. If it does not, the church is destined to be irrelevant, indifferent, impotent, in fact, an antiquated relic from the past that has nothing to say, will have no influence, and ultimately will have no usefulness in our world. And so today I, I want to press forward a bit. I want to I kind of go back to some fun, fundamental foundational issues. But I'm going to press forward into some things that I'm going to challenge you. That you are going to have to think critically. You're going to have to be discerning. You're going to have to be informed about issues. And you're going to have to break them down and examine them in light of Scripture, so that it will define how you respond and how you criticize the things that are going on in our world today. So, with those things being said, let's read our text again, 1 Corinthians 15, and let's think about, again, the application, implication of this gospel. Paul wrote for us, now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you're being saved if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance 
with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the Twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But, By the grace of God, I am what I am. His grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, so you believe. Pray with me. And Father, we thank you for your truth, for the reality of that which was accomplished by your Son at Calvary for us. We pray that the very power that raised your Son from the dead would also work powerfully in us in these days that seem increasingly dark and increasingly difficult. May we know the the glory of your grace, for the very praise of that glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we see here in these 11 verses one of the most concise, one of the neatest statements of what God has done for us, for how he sent his son into this world to live a perfect life and die an atoning death on the cross at Calvary for our salvation. That was the very core of everything that the apostles preached. Uh, As Paul would uh, reflect upon his time in Corinth, he said, guys, listen, I determined when I showed up to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified, that everything flowed in and out of that historical reality. Now, he goes on and he mentions two or three, in two or three ways, two or three phrases here that are kind of what I want to get our minds around uh, today. There in verse 1, he speaks of this gospel, again, the truth of what Christ did, historical fact, reality, is that which you received and in which you stand. Now, I think I have mentioned when we looked at this originally, uh, I grew up in a, a world with a dad that you didn't just stand around and do nothing. You did something. You got busy. And the idea of taking your stand upon the gospel is not, I'm just loafing and, you know, I believe the gospel, but it really doesn't make a whole lot of difference. It's just there. No, it is the idea that I have taken my stand and I'm prepared to deliver a blow with the gospel and I'm prepared to receive a blow from the world on account of the gospel, but I'm prepared to stand for it and stand on it. Okay, it's an active concept. And so... We have taken our stand, and we are being saved. Notice that present tense verb. You, by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, hear me, and hear me clearly, because I mean it like I say it, you are being saved right now by God's grace from the stupidity that the world is advancing today. Okay? You are being delivered. You see it for what it is. You see it for the foolishness. Things are being proposed that have never worked, they will not work, and they will frustrate the people who embrace them. And so we are actually being saved by the wisdom of God from the idiotic stances that are being proposed upon every street corner. So we, are, we have taken our stand. We're being saved. We're holding fast. Now, you can't hold fast to something that you don't thoroughly understand and believe. And we must always be going back and be mining the riches of the Word of God for the good of our very soul. Uh, we, we must do this individually. Like, like I say, listen, if the last time that you thought about the Word of God 
And the last time that you picked up your Bible was when you left here Sunday afternoon at, I know Josh is a bit long-winded, so probably 1245 or something like that. You know, yeah, yeah. You know how Josh is. But if, if the last time you had any thought about the implications of the gospel, you have not entered this room prepared for worship. I'll just tell you that. You, you must be in the constant state of preparation for the act of worshiping God. And remember, while this is, this is important, it's a priority, it's essential, we must gather together, we must also worship 24 hours a day and seven days a week. If we're going to work, if we haven't worked before we arrive, if we haven't worshiped before we arrive here, most likely we will not worship once we have arrived here. And so, we are holding fast this proclaimed truth. And that's what you hear from this pulpit, where, whether I am standing here or, or one of my fellow elders is standing here, you hear the proclamation of the truth of the gospel. And then in verse 10, Paul goes on to explain, by the grace of God, I am this transformed individual. I'm not the Saul who persecuted. I'm not that individual any longer. I'm a man that has been saved by the grace of God. I have been transformed by the power of God. And that is who I am. That is what I live for at this particular time, that God's grace was not in vain. God's grace cannot, by definition, be vain. That is, if there is nothing to your understanding of the gospel that is powerful to change you, to transform you, to define you, you have believed in vain. The power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead has not been applied to your life. And so Paul says, because God's grace was active and powerful in me, then it was not in vain. I actually worked harder. And as Paul would explain kind of the corollary in Philippians chapter 2, that, that it was actually God working in him. God's grace working in him that defined who he was and what he did. And so I want to look at kind of four areas uh, from this particular text today. And it, it's kind of, kind of tweaking some of the things that we've heard already. We want to think about the gospel and the new covenant. I want to think about the, the gospel uh, or, and God's law or the new covenant and God's law. We want to look at the new covenant members' responsibilities to one another. And then finally today, the, more, the most difficult area that we're going to consider is the New Covenant community and our responsibility to the world. And so I hope I can move through the first two sections fairly quickly and then get into the, these last issues that are kind of, of new. So the gospel and the New Covenant. God reveals himself and relates to humanity through means of covenant. The initial covenant with Adam was a covenant of works. Adam was commanded to fill, rule, and subdue the earth. That was the charge that he was given. He was also given one prohibition. The prohibition was to not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he was warned that when he ate from that tree, he would surely die. He did, and he did. Okay? He ate, he died. He suffered spiritual death, and mortality entered his experience, entered uh, his uh, realm. And so, many would note, many commentators would note, that these types of treaties that we find sprinkled throughout the Bible can be called suzerainty treaties. And you can Google that, look at suzerain, suzerainty. But it's the idea of a superior entering into a contract, an agreement, a covenant with a subordinate. And in that, there would be kind of a historical, here's the nature of our relationship, and then here is what I'm expecting of you. These are my commands, these are my demands, and here are the various stipulations that you're to, to, to carry out under the covenant. And if you fail to fulfill it, here's what's going to happen. But if you fulfill the covenant, then I will respond 
accordingly. And you think about that. You think about uh, the covenant made at Sinai, how we see all of the history of how God entered into this relationship with these particular people, uh, the Hebrews, and he established a covenant with them and said, here's what you're to do. This is the way you're to live. And if you live this way, I'm going to bless you. But if you don't, I'm going to curse you. And I have that authority to do that. Now, but there are other types of covenants that, that well, the covenant at Sinai was a conditional covenant covenant that is the condition is you obey me you shall flourish and you shall live okay you will prosper in the land but there are also other covenants within the bible and namely both the uh, covenant with Abraham uh, and the covenant with David and then later what we call the new covenant and I think of those as unconditional unilateral covenants they God says to Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless the entire world through you. You're the guy I've chosen to do that. And no matter how stupid you act, how, 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 how magnanimously you fail, you're still it. And then later, he goes to David. And here's this guy that winds up being a murderer and an adulterer. And he says, listen. It's your house I'm going to bless. I am going to raise up the ultimate king out of your house. No, no, no matter how foolish you are, and no matter how foolish and rebellious your descendants are, I've decided to do that. Unilaterally, unconditionally, not based on your performance. Old covenant, based on the performance of Israel. You perform well, you're blessed. You perform poorly, what? You're cursed, you're going to be kicked out of the land. And so we come to the new covenant now here's the, the 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 cool thing about the new covenant all of the covenantal obligations were fulfilled by jesus christ old covenant you got to do this to live new covenant christ did this and you live and not only did christ do this and you live christ suffered the penalty of death for you so that you may live okay and so that New covenant is unconditional with all of its terms and all of its obligations and all of its penalties having been fulfilled in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we say with a sense of celebration that the old covenant has been replaced. It has been rendered obsolete. Now, I'll say more in a minute, but there is still information that is pertinent and applicable to us as new covenant Christians. So, the new covenant was that, was that which was accomplished by Christ. We can think of him on that final night with his disciples as he comes to the end of the Passover meal. He begins to reinterpret those symbols and say, as you have looked back toward that great exodus that occurred for the children of Israel as they left Egypt by my power, under my authority, for my glory, my unilateral deliverance of those people, you're now going to think about the fact that there's an even greater exodus. Not from not from Egypt and not out of slavery to Pharaoh, but out of sin and Satan's mastery. You're going to be delivered and you're to think of this body and blood as the ratification of this new covenant. And so the author of Hebrews goes to great lengths to explain to us that this new covenant is the superior. It is the better covenant. Y'all know how easily irritated I am. But, you know, you can set me off pretty easy and I can get pretty hostile quickly. But one of the problems with prosperity theology is it reaches back and in a, in a perverse way grabs promises associated with the old covenant and says, oh, they're yours here now. You're going to live in big houses and drive nice fine cars because that's all God's will for your life. Hey, if you want to go back and live under the old covenant, just go back and live under the old covenant. See how it works for you. But again, it is blasphemous what they do in rightly or wrongly dividing the word of truth. So we live under the new covenant, biblically defined as superior, as better, because Jesus Christ is the better high priest. Now here's the thing, and remember this. Don't ever think, well, I don't, I don't need a priest. You know, you go to your Catholic friend, I don't need a priest, don't need a priest. 
Yeah, you do. And you got one. His name is Jesus. And he is the perfect high priest that goes before the Heavenly Father and intercedes and says, My blood is sufficient for his sins. And I thank God for that. And that's why we worship him and praise him today because it was finished on the cross of Calvary. So Jesus is, is a better high priest. You know, and the thing is, not only did you have to worry about the fact that, hey, if you got a good one, he was going to die, and then you might get a bad one. But if I were your high priest, and I was doing the intercessory work, you know whose sins I'd be most concerned about confessing? It wouldn't be yours. It'd be mine. Because I would hope to walk out of that Holy of Holies alive. Okay, so Jesus is the superior high priest because, again, he, he is eternal and he doesn't have to deal with his own sin. And he offered his sacrifice in the better tabernacle. Not one constructed by men, but he goes into the heavenlies and to the better tabernacle offers the ultimate sacrifice, which is the better sacrifice as the writer of Hebrews laments. The blood of bulls and goats, they could not cleanse our conscience. It could not accomplish redemption. It could not accomplish atonement. They could only look forward to that which was actually accomplished in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this covenant actually has better promises. This, this older covenant, the, the, the promises were fundamentally oriented toward uh, prosperity, security, and success in the land, the, the possession of the land for the posterity of, of that uh, generation that, that left Egypt. And in a very real way, this old covenant stabilized, gave order to this nation, in effect, to give stability to the watching world. But it, it was pretty well limited to that particular ethnic group in that particular uh, location. And to be sure, uh, their faithfulness, uh, under the terms of the Old Covenant, there, there, were, there were ways and there were ramifications in terms of uh, eternity, but primarily it was a conditional covenant. Uh, this is how you succeed in the land that I'm giving to you. And everything about the Old Covenant was simply looking forward to the fulfillment of a greater promise promised, accomplished uh, in Christ, uh, a heavenly uh, Jerusalem for those uh, who believe. And so Old Covenant promises, uh, they were good but they were temporary, they were temporal. The new covenant promises the very presence and power of God. That is, God's law is written upon the heart of the new covenant participant through God's unique dwelling in and among the people of God. The new covenant believer lives with better promises and privileges and the presence and the power of God that, that supersedes, that far surpasses anything of the experience of the Old Covenant participant. So that makes us, as, old co as New Covenant participants, better participants because of this reality of the law written upon our heart. I'll say more about that in, in just a moment. We have uh, better success. Old Covenant, primarily oriented toward that particular area, Palestine. New Covenant, the gospel goes into the entire world and it will ultimately conquer the world and the people of God will rule and reign everywhere forever. That sounds a little better than I'm going to give you a piece of desert there by the Mediterranean Sea and you don't have it. Okay? So, better participants, better success, better community. That is, because of this law written upon our heart, that is, under the Old Covenant, you could live in Israel, probably prosper and flourish and be successful with your farm or your, your other endeavors, and actually be an unbeliever. You just behaved. And many of the other people in the society, they behaved, and they worked and played well together, and things went okay uh, for them. But by definition, now, you'll hear me sometimes talk about the true church, in the visible church, something like that. Not everybody that attends church is regenerate. Not everybody that comes to church, not every church member has actually been born again. But by definition, if you are a member of the New Covenant community, you are regenerate. That's how you get to be 
in that community. You're a participant in a superior covenant. And again, God's law has been written upon your heart. So, second thing, let's look at God's law and the new covenant. As I said, we're, we're not under it. The, the obligations have been met in the Lord Jesus Christ. But its objective standards for morality are still vitally important. Now, do you want the insight, the opinion of a perfectly holy and righteous God to inform your society, or do you want the op opinions of people who are so open-minded their brains fell out 25 years ago to form and divide and discern and build the society? Who, which set of wisdom do you want to be embraced by the society? And so, the Old Covenant contained all of these obligations, all these stipulations that, were, uh, that the people of God were placed under obligation uh, to perform. It was a written testimony of uh, the will of God. And again, there were warnings and promises associated. If you, if you fail, again, I'm going to uh, destroy you. Notice there's no such warning under the New Covenant. If, if you're under the New Covenant, you have succeeded. You, you are blessed. You are prospered by definition because everything has been performed for you by the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, the law has been fulfilled. That is, the obedience demanded under the law accomplished by Christ, the penalty demanded by the law, again, paid by Christ. God has been satisfied. And now, that which was promised in Jeremiah 31, 33, namely, the law has been written upon the heart of the new covenant participant. So let's look at where the writer of Hebrews, Hebrews 8, you'll turn in your Bibles over there. Let's just see this, where he quotes, and he picks this up a couple of times, actually, in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 8, let's begin in verse 10, he's again speaking of the realities of the old covenant, he's been explaining how, how the new covenant is, is superior in multiple ways, and then he reaches back and says, now, what is going on in the here and now, what God is doing in the here and now, was actually that which was prophesied by Jeremiah and others. And so in verse 10, he's quoting from Jeremiah 31. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds. I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God. They will be my people. In other words, now, now what, 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 there's really no obligation there on the part of the subject. God is just saying, I am bringing you into this covenant, and everything that you need to bring, I've given you by grace. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. Now, you could be an Old Testament Israelite. You could live kind of under the terms of the Old Covenant, but you could be unbelieving. Your farm and your sheep may flourish, but you are still unbelieving. Okay? And so... But if you are a participant in the new covenant, you are by definition, you are regenerate and you are believing. And to those who are part of that community, to those who are regenerate, I don't have to say to you, you need to know God. You need to know the gospel. By definition, you know God in his gospel. Okay? Where in the other community, the old covenant community, they always need to do evangelism because most of them were actually unbelieving. Most of the members of that community were unbelieving. For they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest for I will be merciful toward their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. Now I can tell y'all are Baptist. Maybe a few Presbyterians mentioned in here. Okay? Mixed in. Because a normal joyful Christian when I read, I will remember their sins no more, I ought to jump up and run around the room two or three times, you know, raising their hands. But we're Baptist, and I understand, okay? All right, so we form a distinctive community, all right? And so what has happened now, 
maybe even the course of the life of this nation, that the ethical or moral norms affirmed and accepted by the culture were very similar to the ethics and the, the, the normative behaviors that were affirmed and asserted within the church. They, they kind of, in some sense, were not perfectly parallel, but, but, but fairly parallel. You know, uh, I just got back uh, from uh, a, a, a ski trip out west. And uh, in Salt Lake City, Park City, you've got a, a real funky blend of, of pagans and Mormons. I don't know what you get when you mix pagans and, and, and Mormons, but uh, whatever it is, it ain't good. Now, but here's the thing. You could be out on the slope skiing and come to a restaurant and think, I'm going to go in and get a drink of water, I'm going to go to the bathroom. You take your skis, which are probably $1,000. You know, you rent them, I don't own a pair of skis. You stick them in the snow, you put your stuff in, you walk in, and guess what? Because there is kind of a permeating Christian ethic that says, I don't need to steal that guy's skis. Now, let me, let me tell you, if I went to the drive-in in my car, you know what I would do to my car? I'd lock the door. I'd lock the door here in beautiful downtown Clay, Alabama. I locked the door in the parking lot of North Clay Baptist Church, okay? All right? But, but, the, but there's a kind of a society there that for whatever reason, for whatever their basic reason is for not doing it, they don't steal your skis, okay? That's a good thing, okay? It's a good thing to not be at 10,000 feet and not have any skis, okay? That, 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 that would be a very bad thing. So what I'm saying, there's still a little bit of a, a, a leftover there, okay? Uh, that, 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 that my stuff was stolen. But here's the thing. The lines are not converging. They're diverging. That, that which we think of as right and true and normal is not only is being undermined and ultimately rejected by the world, and we are going to have to be a far more distinctive and discerning and different community. Okay, we, we're the, that that in years past, average Southern culture of the church didn't see much difference. In the years ahead. There's going to be a dramatic difference, an increasingly dramatic difference. And again, why? Because those that are a part of the New Covenant have had God's law written upon their heart by the work of God's Holy Spirit. Let's move forward. Third issue. This new community of those who have had God's law written upon their heart, okay, this new community and their responsibility to one another. Now, I've, I've never done this. Probably didn't want to feel guilty. So, I, you know, you avoid things in the Bible that make you feel guilty. That's one of the ways you do your, I'm kidding. Okay, I'm just kidding. But you can do a thing where you can look up all of the one another's in the Bible. I've heard a lot of people say, what you need to go is go look at the one another's. What are our obligations to one another in this community? So, first and foremost, we love God. Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So you can understand the reality of the power of the gospel if you are oriented, you're inclined, you're drawn to the obedience to and of the Word of God. And we take this Word together and we teach one another. Going back to the Old Covenant, but I think this brings forward and probably every child I've ever dedicated I've used this passage of Scripture. Deuteronomy 6, 4. Sometimes it's called the Shema. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words I, that I command you today shall be on your heart. Get this. You shall teach them to your children. And so it's impressed upon our hearts and we see the urgency of impressing it upon the hearts of our children. Now, I've said this many times before. I have reached the lofty status of, of grandfather, and, and, and it, it is a privileged position, and I, and I love it, okay? It, but here's the thing. My grandchildren need to be born again. And the most urgent concern 
upon my heart and mind. It's not how successful they are, how well they perform in school, if they're going to play in the Super Bowl or whatever. My most urgent concern for my grandchildren is that they be born again. And so it is incumbent upon this community, the church, and upon their parents to teach the truth of God to that generation. And so we, we love God together, and we come together uh, to worship and to serve and express our obedience in community because that's important to each other. Now, people tell me all the time, and I don't see it really, that I'm getting older. I don't know, every time somebody comes, something comes up on Facebook, somebody says something about me. It's okay, I'm not sensitive, okay? Now, you laugh at that. Now, one of the things that I have found in about the last 10 years, that I am very sensitive to, is hydration. Now, if I piddle around over the course of the day and drink a whole bunch of coffee, Coke, and tea, I will feel like rot by the end of the day. I mean, headachy and just sort of not just, it just doesn't work. And it takes enormous quantities of water for me uh, every day. Uh, I, I, I was sitting on the plane yesterday, and you know how airplanes are, and I kind of bent my right knee back, and I got a cramp in my hamstring. And so I'm sitting there at 30,000 feet trying to, trying to stretch that cramp out. Uh, years ago, I was sitting right there on the front row. This is the first time it ever happened to me. I've been out deer hunting. You know, cold will dehydrate you like heat will. And I was trying to do something to my microphone, you know, and I was twisting around, and I got a cramp right under my rib cage. And so I'm sitting here, this was back when we had a choir, and bless her heart, Brandy Duncan was sitting up there in all her, her pristine glory, you know. And, and I'm sitting on the front row going, <laughs> and her eyes are getting about, and I'm saying, please, Lord, don't let her come down here and start doing chest compressions on me, okay? Now, but I'm very sensitive to that. I get cramps very badly. I, I, I need a lot of water. Let me tell you what I need more than water. I need to gather with I missed y'all last Sunday morning. If you want to dry up and blow away spiritually, if you want to cramp up to the place that you cannot function, neglect this reality of joining together as this new covenant people of God. As we, as we look at each other, as, as Paul describes in 2 Corinthians, that, that we... We even look at each other's faces and go, ah, man, there's something going on in it. And as I look at the world, I'm, in, I'm discouraged. But if I look at you, I'm encouraged because God is real and true and powerful. And we need to see it in each other's faces. And so we have uh, responsibility uh, to one another uh, to, to love God and to love one another. Jesus said, by this shall all men Know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And there's a sense where the world looks at us. It's real interesting, one of the things from my past, the baggage from my past. And, you know, as, as I was with, with an old friend from, from my hometown, and if we spend any time together, invariably, invariably, the subject of the latest church squabble somewhere in Chattooga County comes up. Somebody got mad at somebody else in the church, and my friend is an insurance agent who's a Methodist, bless his heart. He goes, hey, it's okay with me. I'll just get to write another insurance policy to another church. But what a tragic testimony. What a tragic testimony that every time something comes up, the answer is what? We're going to divide up, choose up, split up, and go somewhere else. Okay? And so we're people, we're defined by truth. Okay, we, we can't compromise the truth. But my, 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 how we are to love one another. We are to serve one another. Jesus gave that great illustration of washing the disciples' feet. And, and really, the, the example wasn't so much about practical service. I mean, it, 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 it's a little bit of that. But remember how he explained it? No, you don't need a whole bath. You've been bathed. 
You've been bathed by the gospel. It's just you're still living in this nasty, stinky world and your feet get dirty and they need to be cleansed daily to keep that from defining your life. And so it's not so much that we always got to be at each other's house cleaning each other's house. But that's okay if you want to come do it. But that's not the point. The point is we serve each other by helping each other in this process of sanctification so we don't let the world stink us all up. Because that's what the world will do as we embrace it. I wish I had time to go a little further, but just if you want to check something, go read Second Thessal oh, excuse me, First Thessalonians four to the end of the book and Second Thessalonians three. And it, Paul really gets very explicit as to how we're to live together. And just one of the things as we as I begin to talk about our responsibility to the world. And he says, stay away from the brothers that are idle, that are refusing to work. Remember I, my example? When I was with you, I worked. And he goes on and says, what? If a man will not work, what? Well, make sure he gets a check from the government every month if he doesn't want to work. Right? That's a foolish idea. It's an evil idea. It's an unbiblical idea. It is an idea that will destroy society. So yes, us mean-spirited Christians say no to that type of foolishness. That is the distinction between us and the world. Our Bible says what? Don't work. Don't eat. Very simple concept. Okay. In the church we in instruct one another. Ephesians 4. He gave apostles, prophets, and evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. That seems to suggest kind of a hierarchy type of order uh, for instruction within the church. Very important. We come together to hear uh, the, the man that God has called to instruct us from the Word of God. But also we do it organically. And it seems like in Colossians chapter 3, Paul is giving all of these various exhortations for the believer and how the believers are to, uh, to kind of live together. And he, and he says this in verse 16. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another. One another. Now, I kind of kidded about 1245 a minute ago. One of the coolest things that you'll see happen at North Clay Baptist Church is the last staff member here has to turn lights off and say, listen, you, know, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Okay? In that there's a one another going on throughout the building. People are fellowshipping. And they're not just talking about, oh, the Packers got beat last night, or this team got beat, or, you know, what, they're not, but they are giving the reality that the Word of Christ is dwelling richly in and among them, and they're teaching, and they're instructing one another, they're encouraging one another, young mothers are talking to each other about, here are the challenges I face every day of my life, young dads are talking to this is, this is what I have been through, and this is how I found the Word of God a, a place of strength and encouragement so that I may head into this next week and, and not be discouraged and despondent. That's an organic thing that, that, that takes place among us, and it's a necessary thing. And so we instruct one another, and we serve one another. We've talked about that a bit already, and of course... We gather together in the upshot of, and, and, and listen, I believe the gathering of the church is essential. That is nothing new since we invented the coronavirus, okay? You go, I've been here 18 and a half years, and you go back. If, if you want to give Drew something to do, he's not doing a whole lot, of, I don't think, here. I'm kidding. Don't, don't hit me. He can go back and research the archives and show you how many times over the last 18 years that I have hammered home the necessity of not forsaking the assembly of yourselves together. I told you, it affected me spiritually to miss y'all last week. It really did. And, and there's no substitute for it. I, I understand the concerns and health concerns, and, 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 and I'm, I'm not trying to jump on anybody's case. I'm not, I'm not threatening. But I'm saying that no matter what the reason is, there is a necessity for your spiritual flourishing to gathering with and as the body of Christ. Okay? There's something that God does in us and for us and through us that as we gather, we need it. All right, final thing, fourth thing. The New Covenant community's responsibility to the world. 
Go back to Jeremiah 29. We, we read that text earlier, and I, I just want to point something out to you. And We have to be careful bringing old covenant concepts forward, okay? I, and I understand that. But it's interesting that in 1 Peter, and, and we see this fairly often in Peter, the language that identified Old Covenant Israel is applied to the New Covenant Church. That, that informs us, and uh, uh, I think the last Wednesday night I was here, there was a really vicious debate among some of our young men over dispensationalism and covenant theology, and you know, I had to kind of break them up and pour water on them and cool them off and all these things. And so, so there's, but, but the church is the fulfilling of whatever God is doing to fulfill each and every promise that He has ever made. I don't know how it's all going to work out in the end, but it will be according to God's perfect plan. So, Peter picks up this language, you're, you're soldiers, you're aliens, you're, you're strangers in a, in a strange land, which is what Jeremiah is addressing here. Because of your rebellion, because of your failure under the terms of the Old Covenant, you're now being exiled to Babylon. Now go up there and plant bombs and burn buildings and, and poison their water and do everything you can to destroy that society. No. Go flourish. It's, it's going to be a terrible place. And, and it, I hear Christians, I, I just can't bear bringing a child into this horrible world. Bring the children into this horrible world and teach them diligently so they shall know their God and make a difference in a world that's dead and dying. Okay. Amen. So, have children. Have, have sons and daughters and multiply. Don't de decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I sent you in exile. Now remember, you're in exile. You're there because of your disobedience. That's not your home, but you're not to undermine it. You're to do what you can that that society flourishes so you may flourish. So our responsibility, in a, as, while we're living as exiles, we're not home yet, okay? This is not our home. But we have a responsibility to the world to first and foremost preach the gospel, to make disciples now and, and, and sometimes I, I really wrestle with this it's a terrible thing in some sense to insist that God's law is true and uh, the way uh, God defines marriage and the family and what God says we should do and shouldn't do these are good and, 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 and they're going to make you happier in this world and, and they're just good for your health and on and on and on and without Jesus you're still going to die and go to hell First and foremost, preach the gospel. We want to make disciples. We want to instruct those disciples as to the truth of the Word of God. But Jesus also said we're, we're salt and we're light. This world is decaying. And salt seasons. And it, it inhibits uh, decay. It actually even has a medicinal quality. Any, anybody had a sore throat and ever gargled with salt water? There's a reason you do that. And so we're to make a difference in the world with the truth. Even to the point, and Paul describes it this way in 2 Corinthians 10, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and, and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. In a few weeks or a few days, I suppose, I'll watch at least a little bit of the Olympic Games, and I'm sure it will be the platform in which everything that God condemns will be celebrated, and those that embrace these virtues will be declared champions. I'll just leave it at that. I think you know what I'm talking about. And so... We need to be prepared to understand. And I, I don't know, I, don't, I, I, I know sometimes I'm crass and I'm crude, and, but I, want, I, want you to, I don't want you to miss the point. But we need to be able to outline the absurdity, the absolute stupidity of what is being asserted and affirmed within our culture. Is that clear enough? Okay, if you're offended, you're offended. 
but we have to destroy. You know, people have these beliefs. They have a reason for the belief. Sometimes it's just the way they feel. But sometimes it's some kind of, you know, uh, pluralistic, universalistic, who knows, some kind of uh, philosophical platform by which they come to these positions. And the Bible will inform us to destroy every single one of them. Sometimes before we can do, an evan do evangelism, you have to destroy the strongholds that they have built to, to uh, defend themselves against the gospel. And so none of this foolishness that's being advanced by the world will work. And we have to be prepared to shine God's light, no matter the repercussions. Uh, in Johnny's prayer, I believe he mentioned in Canada last Sunday, a law went into effect that if you preach biblical sexuality in a Canadian pul pulpit, you can be arrested for hate speech. And folks, I'm telling you, there, there are thousands, even millions of people in our country right now that want to pass that same type of legislation. Okay? To make it a crime to speak and to counsel according to the Word of God. And so we must, we have taken our stand. I shall not be moved. Okay? We must be prepared for this. We must be on our guard against loving the world. I did a thing, I think it's been about a, year, a little over a year ago, and regarding the spirit of the Antichrist. Okay? There's two parts. You can get Drew to look that one up for you. You can be mad at me like a lot of other people were. It's okay. It's not the first time. I would not trust, just at face value, any cultural institution. Government, media, academia, medicine. I'm not saying they don't have some truth. I'm not saying they don't, that they're not sometimes right. But I'm telling you, you better be discerning about what's coming from this fallen world's institutions. You better know what the Bible says about the issues of the day and be prepared even to dismantle their foolish arguments. And so, we're aware of the evil of our day. And we are admonished and we're empowered to be the distinctive, defining community that can step into the world and speak truth in the midst of the lies of the current culture. If the gospel does not inform, if it doesn't empower, if it doesn't encourage, if it doesn't convict you of the necessity of doing these things in this current moment, you have not believed the gospel of a crucified Savior who has been raised from the dead. I believe the applications and the implications of the gospel are an essential, intrinsic aspect of that gospel. Now certainly, we're going to disagree on things from time to time in the church. That happens. But I believe that we know the truth. And I mean, there that... We, we live in the midst of, of, of this neo-sexual revolution, again, where vice is seen as virtue and virtue is seen as vice. We, we, I've already mentioned what I think is looming hate speech legislation. Uh, the government has make, make, already made a test run to see how much they can control us. Now, now here, and I've said this, but this, this nation is being groomed by all of its institutions that are under the spirit of the Antichrist. They're being groomed to accept without discernment everything that is asserted as right and good by this evil, fallen, institutional world. And we've got to be prepared to stand and even suffer. And so, we can't afford to be uninformed we can't, we can't run. Uh, I mean, seriously, there, there, there's times, I think, are there any desert islands available anywhere? Just, you know, I, I, I get it. But God has never called his people to run nor hide. 
He's called them to suffer many times. And it, it's, unless the church is renewed, unless there is repentance, unless there is reformation, revival in the church, there will not be a spiritual awakening in the world in which the world can see the folly of the world and see the wisdom of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Let us pray. Father, thank You for Your Word to us. It is a word of challenge. Indeed, we, we preach, we emphasize, we celebrate a crucified, resurrected Christ for our salvation. But we also confess it is a powerful salvation. It is a salvation that in this very moment, we are being saved from our own wickedness and the wickedness of this fallen world. Father, we pray that by your grace and for your own glory, that you would work in us, within us, and use us for that which you would accomplish for the ultimate consummation, establishment of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray.